again for the sasm uh, yeah. so like it's a pleasure to have you all for this sasm e school webinar series and for today's session we are having renowned diabetologist dr shanmugavelu a secretary of rssdi the tamil nadu chapter uh, he has finished his mbbs from madras university and and uh, mb from same came madras university he has got frcp from glasgow in 2015 fcp from the indian college of physicians in 2016 he has served in uh, tamil nadu services from 91 to 92 he is a life member of ima api rsdi and uh, uh, tipsy and dia he is also a member of easd and ada diabetes uk and acp sir has got a uh, lot of publications he is uh, like he has the like he like is conjoined uh, overseas faculty uh, at the university of newcastle Ast australia from 2001 to 2005 he is the regional faculty of public education of india new delhi from 2010 and till date he has published various articles in various journals and he has contributed topics to the a textbook of diabetes mellitus he has presented papers in various forums he has participated in phase 3 phase 2 clinical trials and uh, and uh, like uh, he has like uh, the, the uh, like multiple epidemiological studies and he, like he is honored with a professor sam gp moses foundation award the uh, the et times inspiring medals of india award and the satyakant 2018 dr uh, Arul Raj, a guest lecture award, and it's a pleasure. Like, like he's going to do a talk of diabetes and mental. Oh, dear sir. Uh, respected uh, moderator, uh, Dr. Nadesh Prabhu, my friend, learned viewers and the listeners of this program, as well as the members of this particular organization, I feel extremely happy, honored, and most privileged to have been invited to make a presentation on diabetes and men's health with a particular focus on male sexual dysfunction. diabetologist perspectives i thank uh, dr nadesh prabhu for his generous introduction also thank the organizing committee members for inviting me to be the faculty for today's program uh, my disclosures so what i'm going to do for another 40 minutes the contents of my talk plan include introduction the physiology and functions of testosterone classification of sexual disorders including erectile dysfunction consensus guidelines on male sexual dysfunction based on the alliance a consensus guidelines a key messages and conclusions diabetes and men's health so epidemiological data suggest that globally a high prevalence of male sexual dysfunction is observed western studies have reported a wide variation with reference to range of various msds in the united states an estimated 20% of persons have hypoactive sexual desire disorder acquired male erectile disorder has been reported in 10 to 20% of all men a general prevalence of 5% of male orgasmic disorder disorder has been reported so premature ejaculation that is a chief complaint in about 35 to 40% of the men treated for sexual disorders in us commonly reported sexual dysfunctions by adult indian males attending a psychosexual clinics include premature ejaculation 77.6% nocturnal emission 17.3% and erectile dysfunction 23.6% significant proportion of indian males presenting to these treatment settings seek help for various other con concerns related to sexual functioning next is testosterone it plays a critical role in male reproductive and metabolic functioning because very important serum testosterone levels decrease with age and low testosterone is associated with variety of comorbidities including insulin resistance type 2 diabetes obesity and the components of metabolic syndrome as well as cardiovascular disease so men with type 2 diabetes have shown to have significantly lower testosterone levels than men without diabetes so low levels of testosterone has been correlated nicely to obesity insulin resistance type 2 diabetes with reference to insulin resistance one of the risk factors for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease so the primary goals of testosterone therapy are to restore physiological testosterone testosterone levels and reduce the symptoms of hypogonadism so sexual health may be a window into men's health thus more effective communication strategies are needed between clinicians and men with diabetes to ensure that sexual health topics are adequately addressed multidisciplinary care and individualized treatment are needed to optimize the outcome 
Next is physiology and functions of testosterone. So testosterone is a steroid hormone that plays a key role in numerous biological functions throughout male life cycle. In the seventh week of male fetal development, that is intrauterine development, lady cells are formed and begin to produce testosterone, which drives the development of the vast different epididymis and also seminal vesicles. The external genitalia are masculinized by testosterone at eight weeks. So testosterone begins to influence the development of secondary male sexual characteristics and several anabolic processes during the puberty, that is pubescent period. Nine. Secretion of gonadotropin releasing hormone GRH from the hypothalamus causes the release of luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone from the anterior pituitary. The leading cells in the testes release, produce testosterone in response to the release of luteinizing hormone which results in the development of male secondary sex characteristics. After physical maturity has been attained, testosterone aids in erectile function, sustains spermatogenesis, and maintains secondary sex characteristics. Very important. Testosterone therapy may have a positive effect on bones, muscles, erythropoiesis, and anemia, libido, mood, and cognition, penile erection, cholesterol levels, positive blood glucose levels, glycated hemoglobin, insulin resistance, visceral adiposity, and quality of life. So anabolic and androgenic functions of testosterone with reference to androgenic functions influences male reproductive tract and secondary sex characteristics, erections, ejaculation, libido, as well as prenatal differentiation. With reference to anabolic functions, it promotes growth of somatic tissue, formation of bone, erythropoiesis prostate growth and muscle bulk. So defining the terms, what is low testosterone? What is hypogonadism? What is testosterone deficiency syndrome? Testis secretes more than 95% of circulating testosterone. It produces six to seven milligrams of the hormone per day. Of course, small amount of testosterone is also secreted from the adrenals. Testosterone is metabolized to dihydrotestosterone by two forms of alpha reductase in the prostate and the skin. And it is also converted into estradiol by aromatase present in the adipose tissue. So this is all the metabolism. So testosterone is converted into dihydrotestosterone testosterone or into estradiol by aromatase in adipose tissue. So naturally, obese individual with plenty of adipose tissue, there is a conversion of testosterone to estradiol accounting for low testosterone state. So the normal range of total testosterone is 300,000 nanogram per deciliter accounting to 10.4 to 34.7 nanomoles per liter. So most professional organizations suggest that a low T level should be part of the diagnosis of hypogonadism, which is a clinical syndrome caused by failure of the testes to produce the physiological levels of testosterone and adequate spermatozoa. So the definition of hypogonadism means that is failure of testes to produce the physiological levels of testosterone and adequate spermatozoa due to the disruption of one or more parts of the hypothalamo, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the pituitary gonadal axis. So the definition suggested by American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, AACE, for hypogonadism is a testosterone level of less than 200 nanogram per deciliter. Primary hypogonadism is caused by testicular failure, congenital or acquired, characterized by reduced testosterone level, but because of negative feedback, there occurs increased circulating levels of luteinizing hormone and the follicle stimulating hormone. Secondary hypogonadism is caused by inadequate secretion of either pituitary gonadotropins or hypothalamic gonadotropin releasing hormone. It is characterized by reduced testosterone a normal or degrees luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. Next is testosterone deficiency syndrome refers to the signs and symptoms that occur in men with abnormally low levels of testosterone. Next is the circulating endogenous testosterone can be free, that is 2 to 3 percent, or weakly bound to all women, 20 to 40 percent, or tightly bound to sex hormone binding globulin. SHG, which occurs for nearly 60 to 80 percent. So, testosterone is circulating in the blood as free form, as a form bound to albumin or sex hormone binding globulin. Right. Both free and albumin bound testosterone are bioavailable, whereas 
sex hormone binding globulin bound to testosterone is considered inactive and thus unavailable for use in the body. Laboratory measurement of testosterone can include total testosterone, bioavailable testosterone, which includes both albumin as well as free form as well as sex hormone binding globulin. In addition, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone can be measured to distinguish between primary and secondary hypogonadism. Primary hypogonadism, testosterone levels are low. At the same time, the LH and FSH levels are elevated. In contrast, in secondary hypogonadism, the circulating levels of testosterone are low and either normal or low, low levels of LH and FSH. So free testosterone levels are low in one third of men with diabetes that strengthens the case that free or bioavailable testosterone. So free testosterone levels are low in one third of men with diabetes. That is very important. Testosterone secretion varies diurnally and is usually highest in the morning, 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. and lowest in the evening, namely 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Of interest, the circadian pattern of circulating testosterone may be absent or reduced in elderly men. So very important testosterone. So the preferred time for measurement of total testosterone is between 8 a.m. and 11 a.m. And testosterone levels are also higher in late summer, early autumn, and lower in late winter and early spring. So we need to always bear in mind while taking into consideration the interpretation of testosterone levels and measurement of testosterone levels with reference to conditions wherein we want to postulate low testosterone level or testosterone deficiency syndrome or hypogonadism, right? If testosterone levels are confirmed to be abnormally low, measurement of LH and prolactin is warranted. This is very important. And elevated luteinizing hormone levels suggest testicular dysfunction. So since the circulating levels of testosterone are very low, it stimulates the gonadotropin releasing hormone from hypothalamus. That in turn causes the release of luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone from the anterior pituitary. Whereas an elevated prolactin level may indicate the possibility of a pituitary tumor. So we can differentiate. Are we dealing with a primary hypogonadism due to testicular dysfunction resulting in very high levels of LH or a pituitary tumor like prolactin, like prolactinoma? which can also cause increase in the prolactin level at the same time suppresses the I mean, testosterone level. So increase in prolactin level may inhibit gonadotropins, thereby causing secondary hypogonadism. So hyperprolactinemia is associated with the low levels of testosterone. And here the pathology is totally different in contrast to testicular dysfunction, giving rise to low testosterone level and elevated levels of LH. So men experience a more gradual decline in the production of male hormones. After the age of 30 years, the annual, the average annual decline in serum testosterone in men is about 1 to 2 percent. However, testosterone levels vary widely among men and normal testosterone levels are maintained by some. This we need to bear in mind always. So the causes of and risk factors for low testosterone. Pituitary gland becomes less response to hormonal signals and lytic cells become gradually desensitized and decline in number. So erratic LH secretion with the age further impedes hormonal signaling and leads to a reduction in available testosterone. And reduced growth hormone levels contribute to a reduction in bone density and lean muscle mass. So levels of dehydroepiandrosterone and dehydroepiandrosterone sulfate also decreases with the age and may affect psychological aspects of aging. So these all changes we come across due to aging. So there is erratic LH secretion, Hormonal signaling, reduced growth hormone levels, levels of dehydroepiandrosterone and dehydroepiandrosterone sulfate also decreases, and, self, and sex hormone binding globulin increases significantly with the age. In fact, sex hormone binding globulin in an eight year old man is twice that of a 20 year old man. Right. Low testosterone is also associated with a variety of comorbidities including insulin resistance, type 2 diabetes, med syndrome, obesity, osteoporotic fractures, and cardiovascular disease, as well as reduced survival. Other conditions associated with reduced testosterone or increased sex hormone binding global levels include the use of certain medications, alcohol intake, and alcoholic liver disease. So the possible causes of primary and secondary hypogonadism. 
So the primary hypogonadism because of the Kleinfeld type syndrome or androgen receptor defects or 5 alpha reductase deficiency, myotonic dystrophy, cryptorchidism or hemochromatosis, mumps, orchitis because of aging, HIV, AIDS and other chronic diseases. So these are all the causes for primary hypogonadism characterized by low levels of circulating testosterone and high levels of LH and FSH. Secondary hypogonadism and we have the pituitary disorders, HIV, AIDS and other chronic diseases apart from the certain syndromes. So with reference to metabolic syndrome, the individual components of metabolic syndrome are more prevalent. So obesity, overweight or uh, dysglycemia, dyslipidemia, hypertension are more prevalent in men with hypogonadism. Next is cardiovascular disease and reduced survival. The risk of cardiovascular disease is two to five times greater in patients with diabetes than in the general population. So type 2 diabetes become hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia is a risk factor, is a strong risk factor for hyper, uh, for microvascular complications, whereas it is one of the risk factors for microvascular complications because it is often associated with multiple comorbidities like overweight, obesity, dyslipidemia, hypertension, which are independent risk factor for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So the presence of type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease, they increase the morbid mortality, more so when it is associated with low testosterone levels, decreased antigen levels. So men with the testosterone levels in the lowest quad type, that is less than 241 nanogram, had a 40% increase in risk of death compared with men who had higher levels, right? Signs and symptoms of low, low testosterone and hypogonadism. So hypogonadism can also lead to reduced lean body mass, increased body fat, and loss of bone mineral density. Thereby highlighting the fact that plays an important role in the growth and development of muscles as well as bone minerals. Although hypogonadism may contribute to depression in some subpopulations of men, lowest quintile was correlated with the higher prevalence of depression. So depression is an important comorbid condition associated with the diabetes. So men with the total testosterone levels of less than 300 nanogram often develops the signs and symptoms of classic hypogonadism. So always remember the American Association of Clinical and Technologists levels cut off levels for testosterone. So the loss of body hair, dry skin, gynecomasia, degrees with testicular volume may not always occur simultaneously. So subjects with liver disease, thyroid disease, kidney failure, or emotional stress. So erectile dysfunction was associated with the low bioavailable and pre-testosterone levels, age, visceral adiposity, as well as patients with hypertension. A study of several thousand men attending an outpatient ED clinic reported that diabetes associated with hypogonadism could potentially exacerbate sexual dysfunction through reduced mode and libido and compromised penile vascular reactivity. This was an ob observation that was conducted in a study, particular study involving few thousands of patients. Right. Signs and symptoms of hypogonadism. So decreased muscle strength and mass, decreased bone density, increased fatigue, depressed mood, impaired cognition, anemia, sexual signs and symptoms namely decreased libido, intensity of organ orgasm or sexual penile sensation, difficulty achieving orgasm, orgasm or erectile dysfunction. So communicating with patients about low testosterone, sexual health and diabetes. So sexual health may be a window into men's health. Thus more effective communication strategies are very much needed. Screening, diagnosis, and follow-up of men expressing sexual problems could be beneficial in the identification and management of other con conditions, including diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and hyperlipidemia. So we need to provide them proper education. We need to provide them complete information related to diabetes, related to hypertension, related to obesity, and related to hyperlipidemia. And very important thing, sexual health plays an important role it is a window into men's health. So we need to take into consideration that health also. So classification of sexual disorders and erectile dysfunction. So sexual functioning is a complex process involving biological and physiological factors. It is coordinated by the neurological, vascular, and endocrine systems. 
So all the three are important. So hormones, hormonal effects important, nerves, integrity, intact function, proper reflexes, both sensory as well as motor, as well as vascular, with reference to arterial filling up, as well as venous compression. So the classification of sexual disorder is based on international classification of diseases ICD-10 and diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders that is fifth revision. So the classification of sexual disorders. So sexual desire disorders, sexual arousal disorders, orgasm disorders, sexual pain disorders and other sexual disorders. So under sexual desire disorders we have lack or loss of sexual desire sexual aversion and excessive sexual drive and with reference to dsm male hypoactive sexual desire disorder and female sexual interest or arousal disorder under sexual arousal disorder we have failure of genital response that has been very important we have the somatic nervous system we have the autonomic nervous system orgasm disorders orgasmic dysfunction lack of sexual enjoyment and premature ejaculation so premature ex ejaculation occurred for nearly 60, 70 to 80 percent. So male premature ejaculation, delayed ejaculation, and female orgasmic disorders. So sexual pain disorders include non-organic dyspareunia or non-organic vaginism. So genital pelvic pain or penetration disorders, substance medication induced sexual dysfunction. Other sexual disorders we have the paraphilias, genital I mean, uh, gender identity disorders, other sexual dysfunction not caused by organic disorders or disease, unspecified sexual dysfunction not caused by organic disorder. So in DSM, we have the paraphilic disorders, gender dysphoria, we have gender dysphoria in children, in adolescents, adults, other specified gender dysphoria, and unspecified gender dysphoria. If you look at the prevalence of erectile dysfunction in men with diabetes. So I told you sexual functioning is a complex process, right? Sexual dysfunction is one of the major risks associated with the diabetes. So the risk of erectile dysfunction is three times higher in diabetic men compared to non-diabetic men. So erectile dysfunction is defined as the inability of a man to achieve or maintain penile erection for successful sexual intercourse. Right. If you look at the prevalence of erectile dysfunction among men, the prevalence of ED among men younger than 40 years is 1 to 10 percent, whereas in men aged between 40 to 49 years, it is 2 to 9 percent. And the prevalence of the ED to be 20 to 40 percent between the age group 60 to 69 years and 50 to 100 percent between the greater than age group 70 years. Next is erectile dysfunction and diabetes, the risk factors and association. So erectile dysfunction, I told you about the definition. This occurs 10 to 15 years earlier in men with a diabetes compared to non-diabetic men. Right. Next, the severity of erectile dysfunction as well as the occurrence of erectile dysfunction is higher among diabetic men compared to non-diabetic. So it occurs 10 to 15 years earlier and with reference to severity, it occurs earlier and it is higher. Next is the risk of ED, erectile dysfunction, increase with increasing age. And diabetes is associated with the multiple comorbidities like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, overweight, and metabolic syndrome, which are individual, which are independent risk factor for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And they are also they are often associated with the low levels of circulating these uh, testosterone levels, which may also account for it, it, and which may also account for ED, that is erectile dysfunction. These factors are considered to increase the risk of erectile dysfunction. So also metabolic syndrome, next is smoking, autonomic neuropathy, leading a sedentary life. These are recognized as a risk factor for erectile dysfunction. I told you. Hyperglycemia is an important risk factor for microvascular complication. It is one of the risk factors for microvascular complications. And very important thing is, it is often associated with multiple comorbidities like hypertension, dyslipidemia, overweight, which can also amplify the risk for microvascular complications, which may increase the risk of 
erectile dysfunction in men and very important medication use. So the use of medications such as antihypertensive drugs, psychotropic drugs and certain fibrates, they play an important role. So drugs associated with sexual dysfunction in men includes antidepressants, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, next is plactin elevating antipsychotic medications, lithium, blood pressure medications, antihistamines, chemotherapy, anti-HIV drugs, finasteride we use for the management of penile hypertrophy of the prostate, synthetic progesterone like bedroxyprogesterone. Next is with reference to alcohol. Small doses may lead to increased sexual desire, intox uh, desire, but intoxication can result in erectile failure, reduced testosterone and feminization in men, reducing sex drive and performance on long-term use. So if you look into the effect of alcohol on sexual desire, small dose may increase, whereas amount intoxication, that is amount very high low, very high dose, very high alcohol intake can result in erectile failure. Tobacco, erectile dysfunction because of involvement of both nervous system as well as the vascular system. Opioids reduce sexual feelings, decrease desire, erectile and ejaculatory dysfunction. Cannabis indica, dysfunction on long term use. Stimulants such as amphetamine, initially they increase the desire in the short term, but long term use may result in reduced sex drive drive, ejaculatory disturbance, long-term use associated with reduced sexual sensations and reduced sexual performance that we should always bear in mind. So the pathogenesis of erectile dysfunction in diabetic patients. So the pathogenesis is multifactorial as it depends on psychological and organic factors. So the five mechanisms of erectile dysfunction in diabetes include vasculopathy, neuropathy, basal adiposity, insulin resistance, and hypogonadism. So diabetic vasculopathy is associated with microangiopathy as well as microangiopathy. And diabetic vasculopathy because of insulin resistance or hypoglycemia is associated with endothelial dysfunction. And endothelial dysfunction is associated with vascular dysfunction, onset of hypertension, and it is associated with other comorbidities like dyslipidemia. And endothelial dysfunction is, it can result in arterial, it can increase the risk for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease as well as, as well. And of course, endothelial dysfunction is associated with insulin resistance. And insulin resistance is a common phenomena we come across in patients with the type 2 diabetes, obesity, dyslipidemia, and hypertension. So both insulin resistance as well as endothelial dysfunction, they share similar mechanism of actions with reference to pathogenesis of erectile dysfunction. So this diagram shows the schematic representation of pathogenesis of erectile dysfunction in patients with the diabetes. So obesity characterized by increased accumulation of visceral fat that is constant lipolysis. It is an insulin resistant state that is failure of suppression of lipolysis by insulin. Consequently, there is release of inflammatory cytokines like interleukins, human necrosis factor R4 as well as C-reactive protein and the circulating levels of adiponectin as well as interleukin tends are very much reduced. So they create a pro-inflammatory environment that in turn interferes with the insulin secretion as well as insulin action in the periphery. And it results in endothelial dysfunction characterized by reduced availability of nitric oxide, primarily resulting from reduced generation through the endothelium dependent nitric oxide synthesis mechanism and this is associated with low testosterone because I told you increased visceral fat that makes conversion that results in increased conversion of testosterone to uh, estradiol by aromatase enzyme and that results in erectile dysfunction. So the pathogenesis of erectile dysfunction is multifactorial and the five mechanisms I told you and diabetic vasculopathy is associated with the microangiopathy, microangiopathy, endothelial dysfunction, and macrovascular disease damages the blood vessels leading to limited blood flow to the penis. So very important. So individuals with erectile dysfunction always screen for peripheral vascular disease, always screen for cerebral vascular disease or current auto disease. And over a period of two to three years, they may develop symptoms referable to current auto disease. 
and so erectile dysfunction is an important surrogate marker or risk factor for future coronary artery disease and various cardiovascular risk factors associated with diabetes cause penile arterial insufficiency all the upper aforementioned factors ultimately lead to vascular endothelial dysfunction so the potential mechanisms involved in endothelial dysfunction include accumulation of advanced glycation end products so patients with the diabetes hyperglycemia and there is non enzymatic glycation and this results in the generation of advanced glycation end products age age binds with the receptors which are located in various target organs or the tissues right once it binds with the receptors that is present in various tissues or organ it results in the release of inflammatory markers induces oxidative stress and induces dysfunction of sarcoplasmic uh, reticulum as well as mitochondria and this is associated with oxygen increased release of reactive oxygen species so induces oxidative stress also reduces bioavailability of nitric oxide very important also induces nitrosative stress so the reactive oxygen species as well as nitrosative species also elevated and altered endothelial and neutral neuronal nitric oxide synthesis expression and activity so that results in an imbalance between the vasoconstrictive and vasorelaxant intracellular pathways causing increased vasoconstriction so the balance is tilted towards vasoconstriction consequent on increased release of endothelial one and very important thing is the microvascular disease and that also causes ischemic damage in the distal circulation and simultaneously with associated autonomic neuropathy and peripheral neuropathy may lead to diabetic erectile dysfunction due to impairment of sensory impulses from the penis which are carried by the somatic nerves dorsal nerve of the penis which joins with the potential nerve and of, of course the autonomic component is also present along with the somatic nerves and that results in reflex, reflexogenic erectile center and reduced or absent parasympathetic activity necessary for relaxation of the smooth muscles of the corpus cavernosum so we got the sympathetic nervous system activity as well as parasympathetic nervous system activity so sympathetic parasympathetic nervous system activity plays an important role in erection and whereas sympathetic nervous system activity results in relaxation of course we got the somatic nerves next is visceral obesity and insulin resistance or they are interlinked they are distinctive feature they are associated with pro inflammatory state leading to decline nitric oxide activity and availability thus causing erectile dysfunction and clinical trial data report low levels of free testosterone in obese men and the levels of testosterone are inversely proportional also a high deposition of abdominal adipose tissue is observed in hypogonadal patients which further decreases the testosterone level through conversion of testosterone to estradiol by aromatase right so this particular author suggested a possible autoimmune pathogenesis of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism in patient with the type 2 diabetic as indicated by the presence of anti pituitary antibodies at high titers as compared with the age match controls very important so the potential mechanisms involved in endothelial dysfunction i told you very clearly and that is always associated with reduced levels of circulating testosterone and the reduced levels of circulating testosterone is because of conversion number 1 and there is always leptin resistance and leptinemia hyperleptinemia which can also interfere with the gonadotropin release and circulating levels of the uh, testosterone and moreover the inflammatory inflammatory cytokines also they may also interfere with the secretion of lh and testosterone and this in turn suppresses the secretion of gonadotropin releasing hormone as well as the luteinizing hormone accounting for low levels of testosterone so the causes for low levels of testosterone one is aromatase activity and number two leptinemia and leptin resistance and third thing is inflammatory uh, circulating levels of inflammatory markers which can interfere with the gonadotropin releasing hormone as well as luteinizing hormone right next is consensus guidelines on male sexual dysfunction alliance so consensus guidelines on male sexual dysfunction alliance so let us go through the consensus guidelines so number of guidelines are available for the management of male sexual dysfunction but they are limited in scope they focus predominantly on erectile dysfunction on premature ejaculation 
They cover investigations and pharmacological interventions in detail, but they do not explain sexual counseling and gloss over the soft skills that is required for sexual dysfunction management. In addition, being of Western origin, they do not address some of the unique features and challenges of South and West Asian andrology, such as involvement of family members or difficult, difficulty in practicing couple therapy. So Asian patients, they rely upon complementary and alternative medicine to improve their sexuality and do not report male sexual dysfunction. So the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders for the Division, that is DSM-4, clearly states that clinical judgments related to diagnosis of sexual dysfunction should consider ethnic, cultural, religious, and social backgrounds. So Alliance, as a multidisciplinary team of experts, understand this lacuna and feels it necessary to provide guidance to healthcare professionals regarding counseling in sexual dysfunction. So suboptimal counseling may also negatively impact the potential efficacy and efficiency of pharmacological or invasive therapy in men with a sexual dysfunction. That is very important. So always we need to give proper counseling, whether it is going to be management of obesity, overweight or diabetes or dyslipidemia or hypertension or management of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or male sexual dysfunction. So elements in philosophy of Alliance guidelines. So biophysical social model of MSD. So patient synthesity, therapeutic patient education, patient empowerment, shared decision making, minimizing of discomfort of change and coping skills training. So these guidelines provide guidance to healthcare professionals regarding the counseling aspect of sexual dysfunction number one. Patient with male sexual dysfunction must be approached in a holistic manner. That is point number two. Therefore, stress management or specifically coping skills training becomes an important part of counseling for male sexual dysfunction. So the key elements according to Alliance guidelines for successful counseling of MSD that is shown. So attributes of external environment in facilitating effective counseling in MSD patients. So ensure quiet privacy with reference to lighting, dark curtains, soundproofing, optimal room temperature, relaxed ambience. Avoid no external noise, religious or conservative interior decoration, sexually provocative interior decoration, interruptions, telephone ringing, people walking in and out, doorbell ringing. So patient friendly external environment is necessary for successful counseling. And the external environment need not be luxurious or lavishly furnished or decorated. However, it must fulfill a basic needs of the patient. So these are all very important. We need to ensure certain things. At the same time, we need to avoid certain things. So attributes of a counselor that act as a prerequisites for effective counseling in MSD patients. So the counselor plays a key role in the management of male sexual dysfunction. So a few attributes are essential for the success of high quality counseling services. So CARES, that is a mnemonic, C-A-R-E-S, that captures the basic qualities required for a counselor to successfully manage male sexual dysfunction. So CARES, primarily for effective counseling in MSD patients. So first is confident competence. That is positive body language. That is counselors should convey that subject knowledge to patients with confidence. A positive body language that is direct eye contact or warm smile or state back, forward leaning posture. It radiates strength and security from the counselor to the patient. Friendly resonant voice with a pitch modulation and nonverbal gestures. Next is authentic accessibility. That is patients feel comfortable with the normal looking, normal behaving healthcare professionals from a similar cultural background. Authenticity is a soft skill. It must mean genuineness or trustfulness and honesty. So when a counselor smiles, it should be full of warmth. Physicians must be able to convey 
the humanness and concern to the patient. And patient must not feel that they're being treated as an assembly line product. That is A, that is authentic accessibility. Next is reciprocal respect with reference to mutual respect and active listening. No relationship can be successful if the emotion is if the emotion in it are not reciprocal. So we need to take care of the patient's complaints also. The physician and counselor patient relationship is no exception. So mutual respect is essential if this relationship is to be effective. And there is little point in spending energy on counseling a patient. That is reciprocal respect. Next is excessive empathy. That is active expression of empathy and convey empathy. To sympathize means establishing an unequal relationship, while empathizing means a collaboration between equals. Collaboration between equals. It is not just enough to try empathetic. Very important thing, physician must be able to convey the same to the patients. And the counselor must think. So convey empathy. So C-A-R-E, care. And yes, straightforwardness and simplicity. Whenever it's asked or stated or explained, must be done in a simple, straightforward and brief manner. And the same fact should be repeated again and again and in the same manner by different members of the diabetes care team. And patient must feel relaxed and be encouraged to communicate their concerns to the physicians. So we have the confident competence, we have the authentic accessibility, we have the reciprocal respect, we have the expressive empathy, and the finally straightforwardness and the simplicity. So always remember the mnemonic cats. So next is importance of motivational interviewing in promoting lifestyle changes in MSD patients. So we have the water approach, water approach. Welcome warmly, ask and assess, tell truthfully, explain with empathy, reassurance and return. So this is simple stepwise method of motivational interviewing. And the mnemonic must remind the physician counselors to welcome the patient, make them feel at ease, obtain the relevant history, address the queries and doubts and suggest therapeutic measures and build confidence. So warm welcomely, ask and assess their complaints, you explain them clearly, tell always truthfully, obtain the relevant history, assess the queries and doubts, suggest the therapeutic measures and build confidence so that you can provide the reassurance and patients will return. So the verbal and non-verbal cues that need to be picked up by the counselor. So with reference to whole body, that is shifting chair backward, repetitive movements, fidgeting, moving away from the counselor. So frowning, narrowing of voice or sweating, perspiration, turn red in the face, ears, that is the non-verbal cues that need to be picked up by the counselor. Because the counselor must be trained, must be trained to pick up the non-verbal verbal cues or the discomfort. The presence of these cues implies that discomfort allaying or confidence building measures are necessary before proceeding to counsel the patient. So bringing up hands, frequent touching of face or covering mouth with hands. These are all the non-verbal cues that need to be picked up by the counselor. And counselor in turn, they need to change their approach while eliciting history or by addressing the queries. Next is approach to MSD evaluation and assessment. So history taking, that is very important. Namely the chief complaint, sexual history, including the sexual orientation, preference and gender identity. Next is medical history, surgical history, drug history, occupational history, personal history, family history. These are all the benefits of history taking, identification of diagnosis, identification of appropriate investigation, avoidance of unnecessary investigation, identification of appropriate therapy, avoidance of unnecessary therapy, avoidance of unsafe therapy, bonding between patient and physician, improved patient self-awareness, integral part of therapeutic patient education, building of frame for cognitive behavioral therapy 
and encouragement for better bonding right so history taking that is very important complete history should be obtained and history taking not only serves as an opportunity for getting information but also helps in building the therapeutic alliance that is very important so alliance recommendations for eliciting sexual history in male sexual dysfunction patients how is your health how is your sexual health what happened during adolescence what happens now any history of premarital contact extramarital contact is there difficulty in erection is there any problem in insertion of the organ do you have any problems with foreplay is there any difficulty with erection or orgasm any history of skin or urinary infection or sexually transmitted disease have you ever been up attracted to other women have you ever appreciated other handsome men a simple hierarchy of questions following non threatening to threatening pattern should be followed number 1 and this help both the patient and counselor to be at ease and into interview patients with general questions always and very important begin with the questions related to adolescent and then move on to premarital sexual contact next is experiences and difficulties as well as then probe into current marital sexuality these are all very important clues once the genital aspect of sex has been broached move from non penetrative move from non penetrative sexual history right next is general physical examination and gonadal examination in ms patient counseling should follow a complete gonadal physical examination reversible and irreversible physical causes should be ruled out any physical signs of hypoandrogenic state with reference to distribution of body hair or muscle habitus should be notified to the patient healthcare professionals of msd should be aware of phenotype abnormalities which need to be assessed in patients right so counseling it should follow a complete gonadal physical examination and we need to identify the reversible and irreversible physical and we need to look for the signs of hypoandrogenism that is lack of facial hair body hair genicoid habitus and if the lower segment is greater than upper segment or arm span greater than height poorly built musculature poorly developed external genitalia or small sized testes these are the clues for identification of hypogonadism so investigation general hematology biochemistry renal function hepatic function to rule out other causes which can give rise to second hypogonadism of course ultrasound scrotum pineal doppler and of course the indications are only limited pineal doppler to assess the uh, blood flow assess the blood flow with the help of a high uh, transducer i mean high frequency transducer and of course by the symmetry and pituitary imaging mri ct scan to rule out pituitary tumors next is endocrine prolactin testosterone pre testosterone thyroid function test luteinizing hormone and follicular stimulating hormone we can differentiate the primary hypogonadism from secondary hypogonadism and we can differentiate hyperplactinemia producing a pituitary tumors uh, by looking into lh and fsh level as well as the testosterone next is invasive procedures like papaverin test or the pineal angiography of course uh, by eliminating other causes if we are very sure that it is not due to other causes we can do pineal angiography that is injecting the dye selectively into the pudendal artery and of course papaverin test to find out the dilatation of the sinusoids as well as the arterial dilatation so the identification and exclusion of organic causes appropriate, appropriate investigation should be initiated and investigation help ensure the correct choice of therapy that is very important thing so the management of msd counselors must encourage the patient with msd to take a balanced diet rich in vitamins minerals supplemented by nutraceuticals if necessary the physical health enhances sexual fitness attention should be paid to aspects of physical health that may impair sexual function such as obesity musculoskeletal weakness lack of flexibility and other medical conditions so physical activity improvement is very important and of course improvement in physical activity can reduce the body weight it can reduce the body fat it can reduce the blood sugar level it can reduce the lipid levels it can reduce the blood pressure level it can improve the quality of life it can induce a sense of well being 
Yoga is an ancient Indian exercise technique that keeps the body fit, health, and flexible. There are specific exercises or asanas in yoga that may improve sexual function by improving the pelvic blood flow. So there are specific exercises that may improve the sexual. So yoga asanas useful for male sexual dysfunction include yoga therapy for premature ejaculation, three-step breathing exercise, alternative to nostril breathing, yoga therapy for erectile dysfunction, as well as anal lifts, abdominal lifts, and these are all special asanas that has been recommended by a specialist in yoga. Next is psychological therapy, that is relaxation therapy. And very important thing is most physicians and counselors, they used the combination of these therapies and tailored the weightage of each psychological interventions. So relaxation therapy, Master and Johnson therapy, gradual de desensitization, pelvic floor exercise, and eclectic therapy, that is individualized therapy to a particular individual, and yoga. So the common antecedents of MSD, that is related to sexuality, that includes childhood abuse, and Puritan atmosphere at home, childhood exposure to pornography, unpleasant encounters in the past, and sexually transmitted diseases, and chance encounters. Related to general issues include marital disharmony, stress at work, lack of quality time, financial stress, physical usefulness, poor personal hygiene of partner, or irritating tics and habits of partner, and inappropriate external ambience. So this alliance guidelines recommend cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, which follows the ABC. And next is coping skills training. That is thinking too much thinking too about extreme situations or self-blame or blaming others. Next is acceptance, positive thoughts, positive refraining and planning action. These are the coping skill training and putting things in a perspective. And very important thing is MSDs associated with tremendous stress in both men and women. One of the aims of counseling is to help patients cope with this stress. And this training should be included in counseling on MSD to inculcate the positive mechanisms. So religions, religion and counseling. So important aspect of life, especially in South Asia. Religion can be used as a means of motivation, encouraging proactive approach in dealing with health problems, including with sexuality. A, people, a few people find it difficult to differentiate between the religious structures against premarital sex and the sanction for marital co-habiting. A few people feel upset because of MSD and may rationalize their condition by, saving, by saying that they have to suffer in silence because of past mistakes. There are people who may approach religious leaders for treatment of MSD instead of uh, consulting modern medical practitioners. So religious is an important aspect of life, especially in South Asia. And very important that is others feel because MSD may rationalize their condition. Next is pharmacological therapy. That includes nutraceuticals, hormone therapy, or phosphodiesterase inhibitors. So we have the lifestyle changes with reference to medical nutrition therapy, improvement of physical activity, aiming to achieve and maintain optimal weight, cessation of smoking, and improvement of physical activity. These are all risk modification. And of course, obesity and associated cardiovascular risk. And phosphodiesterase inhibitors enzyme inhibitors, they inhibit this particular enzyme, prolonging the activity of cyclic GMP in the cavernous smooth muscle, resulting in increased vasorelaxation and first-line pharmacological therapy. Of course, cortide indicated in nitrate users of the patients who are taking hypertensive agents. And of course, intracavernous or transurethral vasoactive substances, we have prostaglandin 1 or pentolamine or pepaverine, and of course, testosterone, which can replace the normal testosterone levels and especially diabetes associated with hypogonadism. And these vasoactive substances increase the concentration of cyclic AMP, causing smoother relaxation and alpha adenine receptor blocker, and as well as non specific PDE inhibition. So, glycemic control and lifestyle. Several studies demonstrate an association between poor glycemic control and the risk of ED. But not clear whether intensive glycemic control may have beneficial effect. Many cross sectional studies have shown that better glycemic control is associated with improved erectile function. And the period of intensive therapy significantly reduced the prevalence of erectile dysfunction. In type 2 diabetic men, limited data have been reported on risk reduction intervention for erectile dysfunction, and these have had conflicting 
reports or results. So lifestyle changes such as increased physical activity, Mediterranean diet, and reduced caloric diet have been associated with amelioration of erectile function in general male population. Weight loss, low intake of saturated fat, high consumption of more unsaturated fat and fiber, and moderate physical activity, a strong correlation was observed. And the suggested mechanism by weight, weight loss, healthy diet, and physical exercise can improve. Erectile function include the amelioration of endothelial dysfunction, insulin resistance, and low-grade inflammatory state associated with diabetes and metabolic disease. So weight loss improves insulin sensitivity and alleviates or ameliorates insulin resistance improves endothelial function and reduces the circulating markets of inflammatory markers. And this PD E5 inhibitors are considered the first line treatment. And I told you the mechanism of action and diabetic men with ED are less responsive to PD E5 inhibitors when compared with the non-diabetic men with ED and diminished nitric oxide generation in the pineal nerves, endothelium, as well as low testosterone levels of diabetics may be responsible for reduced responsiveness of PD E5 inhibitor therapy. Very important thing is reduced generation of nitric oxide in the pineal nerves endothelium along with low circulating levels of testosterone and intracavernous injection of papaverin, pentolamine and prostaglandin E1 as well as intraurethral administration of prostaglandin or good alternative and both of these two treatment modalities have demonstrated efficacy in ameliorating erectile dysfunction in diabetic patients and the patient should be counseled regarding the availability, safety and utility of neurocytical and the need for proper investigation, medical supervision, and follow-up during the use of neutraceuticals. And of course, fenugreek is a non-neutraceutical substance. It displaces the bone testosterone from sex hormone binding globulin, causing an increase in the free and bone ratio, and therefore making the testosterone more active. So neutraceutical. Testosterone replacement therapy is recommended in men with ED who show low levels of testosterone. And different formulations are available such as gels, patches, tablets, implant, and injection. In a prospective randomized double-blind placebo control trial study, transdermal replacement therapy was associated with the beneficial effects of sexual function in men with a type 2 diabetes. So the delivery system, dosage, and monthly cost with reference to methyl testosterone, flu oxymesterolone, buccal testosterone, non-scrotal testosterone patch, scrotal patch, testosterone zyponate, or testosterone enanthate, gel and pellets and the dosage is given as well as the cost of the therapy the five e's of sexual counseling includes experience etic etiquette empathy ethnic or cultural understanding and environmental environment conducive for relaxation so the device invasive procedure later counseling physician must use easy to understand the language other potential alternatives the advantages and disadvantages of device and university procedures, efficacy of procedure and device and limitations, as well as the possible risk and discomfort. And patient must be kept aware of these facts. And physician must be aware of the details of devices and invasive procedures used to manage sexual dysfunction. And patients who do not respond to non-pharmacological and conventional pharmacological therapy must may need to be treated with various devices, invasive procedures or surgery, and patients who need this treatment must be told about the need for such therapy well in advance and which would encourage them to stick to their decision regarding the choice of treatment and post-device or post-surgical regret. So counseling related to medical and psychiatric comorbidity. So mental illness has a significant effect on sexual function. So sexual dysfunction is a physical or somatic symptom of major depression. And sexual problems include decreased desire, erectile dysfunction, or anorgasmia and delayed ejaculation. And patient must be offered psychological counseling, biomedical treatment, comorbidity management, and sex therapy. And many individuals diagnosed may or may not have psychiatric comorbid conditions. Although psychiatric comorbidity is absent, patient must be significantly distressed and may experience depression and anxiety. And the counseling helps in addressing these issues in MSD patients. So community awareness. So MSD is a couple's concern as both partners are involved. It affects personal, professional, and social performance. And patients are often ridiculed by spouse, family members, and friends, which aggravate illness. So what needs to be done? The community should extend their support and not act as a barrier or hurdle in the sexual rehabilitation process. 
and spread awareness. So male sexual dysfunction may appear as an individual problem, but it is a couple's concern as both partners are involved. In reality, the impact of MSD goes far beyond this. And sexual dysfunction affects a person that is individually as well as in the profession and social. So key messages and conclusions. So sexual dysfunction is one of the major risks associated with the diabetes. Erectile dysfunction is three times more common among diabetic men than among non-diabetic men. Pathogenetic factors are vasculopathy, neuropathy, visceral adiposity, insulin resistance, and hypogonadism. Counseling is an integral and essential part of the management of male sexual dysfunction. It helps in identifying the problem, providing support, and informing patients about the treatment options. So many men with the diabetes who have low testosterone remain undiagnosed and untreated because of a variety of barriers, including lack of patient provided, communication, patient awareness, patient embarrassment, inadequate assessment tool, or provided knowledge, personal, cultural, or gender issues, a focus on acute care or on the current structure of diabetes education program. So the elimination of such barriers is to the goal of providing effective comprehensive care to men with diabetes and is attainable through the implementation of properly structured educational programs targeting clinicians, patients, and the general public. So counseling is an integral and essential part. No medical or surgical therapy is complete without counseling. However, sexual counseling is a challenging task which requires in-depth expertise in soft skills as well as thorough knowledge of hard skills. And the Alliance guidelines provide guidance reporting various aspects of male sexual dysfunction, counseling in a patient and physician manner. While maintaining patient-centered approach, these guidelines draw upon experience and evidence to ensure scientific integrity for the recommendations contained herein. Alliance hopes that Diligent practice of these guidelines will ensure a healthier future for our patient with MSD. My beloved medical professionals, please remain safe, take care, stay healthy, protected, and connected in the days to come. Thank you very much for the wonderful opportunity given. I thank sincerely thank and extend my thanks to Dr. Nadesh Prabhu for providing this digital platform to share my knowledge. Now I am returning my screen. So thank you so much, sir. Uh, excellent session, as usual, for people who listen to his lecture often. And he's a proud woman for me as a student of his uh, course, that is certificate course on evidence-based diabetic management. I've been uh, listening to his lecture, CME, for a long term. And uh, today's talk is something different. It was cover extensively about uh, male sexual dysfunctions and uh, uh, diabetes. So we are having multiple questions which have arrived on Facebook, on Doc Texas, and even on WhatsApp. So I'm going to start one by one. So the first question is, is depression an unknown etiology of diabetes in men? How can this be managed during the lockdown? So one is depression and is depression and unknown etiology of diabetes in men? Are they like they're asking? Can depression be the cause of diabetes? If it is so, how can we manage during the lockdown? Uh, the thing is, depression is one of the comorbid condition, and of course, depression can result in diabetes in the long run. And uh, doctor, I mean psychiatrists, they prescribe antidepressants, and these antidepressants are often associated with change with reference to weight. There is big gain. Second important thing is they are often associated with dyslipidemia, dyslipidemia, as well as the onset of hypertension. So the moment uh, the psychiatrist stop treating the patient with antidepressant, they gain in pain. They develop insulin resistance like that. So pure depression give, giving rise to diabetes in this particular short term during the COVID-19. We need to think of the possibility of other than depression as a cause for. Uh, very high sugar. Very important thing is, I have come across recently one patient, young male, 27 years, no family history of diabetes. That patient presented with 675 milligram of uh, blood sugar level and he was unconscious, he was tachypneic and he presented with elevated levels of uh, urea creatinine, so renal dysfunction. Next is liver dysfunction. 
and he presented with bicarbonate of lead and three so severe acidosis and his uh, plasma ketone levels were more than 7.2 millimoles and very important thing is this is the first time we are seeing the patients and any patient presenting for the first time with very high sugar in the absence of family history he presented with fe febrile illness of brief duration only for two days and in fact we sent the nasal swab for covid it was found it was found to be positive for covid infection that is to say patient present with acute covid infections since ac is two enzymes are very highly expressed both in the lungs as well as in the pancreas that can in turn damage the pancreatic exocrine cells as well as endocrine cells accounting for very high plasma glucose level and in fact this patient's a1c level was just 6.7 a1c was 6.7 imagine so in the short period of time whenever we come across that due to covid we need to rule out and of course depression we should always bear in mind but short term period of depression may not cause that much significant impact so that was a, a very eye opening answer for us sir for diabetes with such a, a huge amount of blood sugar levels but a low level of hpmc so it's a uh, yes insight for us so so that is, that is to differentiate stress induced hyperglycemia from undiagnosed hyperglycemia whenever we come across very high blood sugar on admission we need to check whether the patient gives a history of diabetes or not no prior history of diabetes check a1c the a1c is greater than 6.5 with that amount of blood sugar we normally think it as a undiagnosed in the absence of a1c 6.5 if we come across a1c 5.7 i think it does stress in this hyperglycemia so covid so sars cov2 infection can result in diabetic like status which may be present for a longer period of time we need to watch and follow the patients meticulously okay sir. thank you and uh, how can doctors help in individualizing interventions based on patient's gender needs concerns and capabilities during the lockdown during the lockdown period during the yes. lockdown, of course we normally provide them uh, that is we provide them with general measures general measures that is keeping social distancing number one next is personal hand hygiene and of course very important thing is wearing the mask always wearing the mask always and with reference to any medical professionals whenever we advise we normally tell them limit your consultation and always try to see your patient within 5 minutes of time and the patients who are coming for regular treatment can be managed if possible with the telemedicine and those patients who need face to face presentation you give them a priority and always uh, look into the complaints like that so we need to give them a proper care regarding the uh, personal hygiene yes sir how far do diabetic patients respond to motivational interviewing and self management in india of course it depends upon the place where we practice uh tier one play tier one city i mean major towns they can do practice telemedicine they can do uh, prescriptions over facebook or any social media they like accept whereas acceptance in a tier three cities or smaller towns very practically not possible unless we see them face to face it is very difficult to gain confidence on it it very difficult to gain confidence on it those highly educated patients when they come for any emergency cannot be managed with the telemedicine those patients they normally present with huge lot of complaints they can it cannot be solved on telemedicine only certain things we can we can definitely can gain confidence with some of the ailments not always so emergency cases has to be man managed in a different way and non emergency cases has to be managed in a different way depending upon the availability yes and the uh, next question is a testosterone replacement in young diabetics uh, that is very important very relevant so we normally check the testosterone level and whenever we come across any low levels of testosterone we normally send our patients for endocrinologist endocrinologist opinion and endocrinologist treatment we never treat the patients with hypogonadism though we say we come across because we want to rule out 
other possible causes other possible causes of course we normally try to uh, give them uh, proper history regarding the patient's glycemic control glycemic status and we normally try to rule out other liver disorders or lung disorders or cardiac problem or renal disorders as a cause and we normally check into thyroid functions of everything whenever the whenever the problem comes for testosterone we normally refer our patients to endocrinologists for their treatment because we know the benefits we know the risk and we need to follow the patients whenever the patient is on testosterone whether it's oral formulation or parental formulation or whether we provide them with patches or gels like that again uh, very simple question approach to diabetic hypogonadism diabetic hypogonadism our that is i told you beginning of my lecture i am talking i am going to discuss about male sexual dysfunction diabetologist perspective so the type of sexual dysfunction we come across so whether it is in a psychogenic component whether it is a, whether it is due to neurogenic component whether there is any evidence of autonomic neuropathy whether there is any hormonal related so hypogonadism hypogonadism by definition american association of clinical endocrinology so check the testosterone level between 8 am and 11 am and see the levels and if it is less than 300 nanogram we say it is low and we make a diagnosis of hypogonadism we make a diagnosis but what we are interested is regarding the male sexual dysfunction with reference to erectile dysfunction so whenever we come across erectile dysfunction that due to diabetic autonomic neuropathy or due to any vascular problem and we normally try to uh, stratify the risk factors and we normally try to rule out the possibility of associated coronary artery disease that is other cardiovascular cardiac vascular disease we normally check whether the patient has evidence of peripheral vascular disease also that is our view when managing erectile dysfunction and male rather than treating a patient with hypogonadism okay thank you and uh, soft skills in sexual dysfunction Manage. again yes soft skills i told you regarding the counseling history taking i have given the various questions to be raised with reference to initial examination so the soft skills that is it depends upon the functional integrity of the somatic system somatic system of course this soft skills definitely improves the sensory system in turn it sends reflexes which are perceived at the spinal centers and they are carried by the spinothalamic tract to the heart centers as long as the tract is very intact such skills will offer improvement with reference to male sexual dysfunction male sexual dysfunction right in the absence definitely that means the sensations are not carried properly to the spinal centers it is not related to the center high above for example patients presenting with blunt injury of the pelvis they must have injured it must have injured the, uh, the parasympathetic nervous system as well as sympathetic nervous system with reference to lumbo sacral root at the same time his high centers are intact these high centers can send impulse through the sympathetic through parasympathetic as well as through the somatic nervous system ultimately result in erection what we call it so the high centers will reflex will send impulses both to the to the lower centers right in that way we can assess whether the patient has evidence of any somatic sensory loss or high centers loss so this particular skills will improve the male sexual dysfunction yes sir so regarding the same thing because i have asked the same question to you previously pineal sensory loss in ed this is a very common question among us you have answered uh, like the question the like in the previous webinar just for the audience sake i was asking again yes sir i told you uh, the sensory primary sensory system that is somatic number one that is the touch next is the pain and that is being carried by the somatic nerves i think dorsal pineal nerve which joins the pedalateral nerve and that is carried to the spinal centers from that to the spinothalamic tract spinothalamic tract so when you touch that is fine touch and when you squeeze it will produce pain and when you pinch and when you press that will elicit pain testicular pain that is that is carried 
so that in that indicates patient had somatic sensory system intact in contrast patient with autonomic neuropathy still the sensory system sensation carried carrying sensory system will intact of course that might be neuropathy and this can present as reduced sensation but it is not totally absent on the other hand autonomic neuropathy main thing is parasympathetic and sympathetic one is concerned with arterial dilatation so erection another is concerned with constriction i mean that is relaxation so sympathetic primarily for relaxation and parasympathetic for erection so this sensation is primarily carried by the somatic nerves so peripheral neuropathy in a diabetic diabetic neuropathy it also affects but it is not totally abolished still it is perceived but with reduced sensation sir i come across patients with uh, diabetes and snoring uh like when they present with the ed so uh, like during the history taking i see a lot of patients with diabetes and snoring again when you check for testosterone it is almost low in those kind of patients so uh, hypogonadism causing snoring along with coexisting diabetes so can you add something for us sir? the thing is obstructive sleep apnea is very common it is important comorbid condition associated with the type 2 diabetes when they are obese when they consume more alcohol when they use sedatives or tranquilizers or when they are on antidepressants or psychotic disturbances so they they i mean they tend to gain weight there is simultaneous there is accumulation of fat in the pharyngeal muscles as well as the tongue muscles so that results in obstructive sleep apnea obstructive sleep apnea and of course obstructive sleep apnea uh, may be a part of hypothyroid disorders and may be associated with other endocrine problems like hypogonadism so basically obesity insulin resistance endothelial dysfunction and hypogonadism basically obesity insulin resistance type 2 diabetes basically type 2 diabetes obesity insulin resistance and obstructive sleep apnea obstructive sleep apnea understood sir thank you excellent and uh, we are getting lot of questions about testosterone replacement testosterone replacement modalities in india because you asked answer earlier so i was skipping those questions again yes uh, yes, yes management of diabetes Primarily, i pardon sir, yes, sir. diabetes shall i go to the uh, next question yes sir. because you answered the uh, doubts on uh, testosterone i'm just skipping those questions for you all repeat the same question so they are asking management of diabetes depression and ed the role of ssri and uh, pd inhibitors so primarily whenever we come across depression we normally refer our patients to psychiatrist for getting their prescription number one we tell them this particular patient is already receiving multiple agents and while prescribing drugs you need to see that it should not cause any change with reference to body weight number two change with reference to blood sugar level change with reference to the need for additional medications for the management of hypertension and so on right next is while managing patients with erectile dysfunction i normally put the patient on only so far i have tried only one drug that is sildenafil sildenafil i have not tried tadalafil or vadanafil sildenafil before i prescribe i normally tell them the dosage to be followed and when it should be time of administration and what are the precautions to be followed what are the side effects we come across and it has to be given only once daily that to 60 minutes before the sexual activity and maximum window period we can give is 3 to 4 hours not more than that and very important thing what are the side effects we can come across and before that i normally rule out the possibility of occult cardiovascular disease and whether the patient is already receiving nitrates or whether the patient is receiving treatment with alpha adrenergic blocking agents or whether the patients are taking treatment for uh, benign hypertrophy of prostate like tamsulosin so don'ts should be uh, uh, taken into consideration before prescribing this particular drug right so i normally tell them to begin with 25 mg or 50 mg once daily and maximum dose i have tried is only 100 mg 
I have not gone beyond the dose, beyond 100 milligram. And of course, whenever they use, I normally tell them the efficacy will come down after prolonged use and the, the impact of the efficacy will be little bit reduced compared to non-diabetic men using this particular medications. That is number one. One of the patient is on other uh, serotonin receptor uptake I mean serotonin uptake receptor inhibitor like duloxetine I normally tell them I normally tell them this drug can cause important this drug can cause erectile dysfunction and we need to reduce the dose of such agents if at all we want to prescribe the agent primarily for the management of erectile dysfunction thank you sir very in-depth uh, discussion on siltanafil and other SSRIs. So, uh, let, let me come to the last part of the program. We have a couple of questions. The one question is, what can be done for the community awareness? As this is a very sensitive topic to be spoken publicly. I told you, coping skills, the key message before that, community awareness. That is, we need to give them uh, uh, proper advice to the couple. And very important, it must be sensitized to treat such men in human supportive manner. And community should not act as a barrier or hurdle in sexual rehabilitation process. And public awareness must also be created regarding the potential risk, discomfort, and harm caused by untested treatments offered by unqualified practitioners of complementary and alternative therapy. That is my strong Excellent. advice and a strong. Uh, to create community awareness. Each and every opportunity available should be utilized to spread awareness about the utility and benefits of modern non-pharmacological medical and surgical strategies for MSI. Excellent, sir. So you have given a good note on this. We will be following. One last question from my side. So there's a recent concept called us early vascular aging along with diabetes mellitus. Just one last question, sir, because we are seeing a lot of patients with vascular stiffness when they come to the clinic. There's a loss of vascular complaints in them, the loss of dichrotic notch in the pulse, in the pulse wave plethysmograph. I see a lot of patients with vitamin D deficiencies and diabetes along with this vascular aging. So do you have anything to add upon for us, sir, for a learning purpose? Yes, definitely. Definitely, sir. The vascular aging occurs much early in patients with diabetes because of the metabolic environment. And second thing is, it is often associated with obesity and the circulating levels of inflammatory markers are very high. They may modify the actions of insulin. And next is, very important thing is, they are often associated with abnormalities with reference to lipid and a combination of glucolipotoxicity with advanced glycation end products and other metabolic pathways like polyol pathway or hexosmin pathway. They may actually uh, accelerate or they may stimulate the other growth uh, factors and uh, these growth factors are released in response to inflammation oxidative stress which in turn increase the uh, I mean uh, synthesis as well as the expression of various collagens elastins and in this in turn it gets deposited in various blood vessels accounting for increased arterial stiffness so accelerate aging which occurs much early in a diabetic patients so like like is it reversible is it it's reversible a very tricky question. it is a very tricky question because uh, if you uh, consider type 2 diabetes the onset of all the process begins 10 years before prior to the onset of pre-diabetes and we are making diabetes almost 10 years after all the pathological process have been initiated. Certainly. By the time we make a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, patient must be having evidence of arterial stiffness and dyslipidemia, its impact on the blood vessels, various oxidative stress, imp their impact on various blood vessels and various organs. So I don't think it is reversible. Thank you, sir. And thanks for explaining all the questions clearly. So it was again a pleasure having you here and uh, we thank Doc Texas for the support for the program also, sir. Thank you. And my question, shall I ask one question to you finally? Please, sir. Pleasure.
yes sir that is regarding your uh, regenerative medicine stem cells yes sir. Yes, sir. stem cells and uh, erectile dysfunction because uh, you have been telling in most of the forums uh, stem cells and the role of stem cells in uh, restoration of erectile dysfunction in patients with the diabetes so to add upon that see like uh, uh, like we have seen patients uh -huh. coming with diabetic and ed initially we thought that just by restoring the growth factors we can reverse the ed but there are other components as you say we like we are, we attempt to understand ed a lot there is vascular stiffness is there there are psychological things are there so when the patients are not responding to any of the pd inhibitors we put them on a thing called as shock wave therapy or take a dose for this uh, a pr injection because stem cells have some like experimental people are doing in the very research centers but bone marrow cell therapy people are doing very commonly we are not seeing any great effects but when the patients are not responding this we are uh, like we are offering as a one of the treatment modalities pure experiment based modalities so we like in this current era we cannot decide which patient will benefit the best from this uh, original medicine but it's still one of the uh, good hopes for pay, for, like for the patients who are uh, willing to uh, go off medications or who are willing to again respond back to medications this is the current stance we have like which we are seeing in, like in regenerative medicine as of now stem tube cell from stem tube tix it got approved last month so we are looking for a approved stem cell product which a clinicians can do a proper clinical trial as a off label use now we have an icma dcg approved product so now stem cell use is very regulated and with the quality of stem tube tix product we can try for patients so can, can we uh, uh, so do you like like any questions over the can we can cool no sir thank you so much thank you so much thanks a lot thank you sir thanks so much